Hey guys, we're back again. We get asked the question, should I refinish my mill syrup? Hmm, we're gonna answer that question today. 1916 Spanish Mauser that needs a little bit of armory refreshing here. So I brought my friend Bob from rustblue.com down to show you how to basically turn a cinder block black. This guy knows how to do it. So we're on the, on the money there. So say hi, Bob. Hi, Bob. Outstanding. <laughs> All right, Mark, what we've got here is a, uh, a Spanish uh, model 1916 uh, carbine. It's chambered in 757 Mauser. Okay. Um, this particular uh, firearm was imported by Samco. Where's that import stamp? I never even uh, saw the import stamp. Import stamp on this particular model is stamped right underneath the barrel in between the, the front sight band and the upper band. Wow, it was awful nice of them to not farb it up by writing yeah, it right on the side not, of the receiver, not, wasn't it? Not the usual dot matrix. You see how handy that is? Yes. Okay. It, uh, it's actually in pretty good condition. I'm impressed with it. It's, it's, it's sporting its original finish. Uh, you can tell by looking inside the action, it's unblued in the raceways, which means this, this gun is still wearing its original rust blue that it carried from the factory. Um, it, uh, uh, it's got a little bit of surface rust, but we're gonna be cleaning some of that up today. So basically we're gonna do an ordinance level repair on this. We are, we're, gonna, uh, we're not in the business, of, or I'm not in the business either of trying to, to make a new gun out of an old gun. Uh, my objective in these is, is, a, is a functional restoration, I call it. And that is, we, we wanna do what the Armory would have done had, had, this, had this weapon been sent into a depot for refurbishment. We want to try to do exactly what they would have done, and we want to replicate the, the finishes that they used on the metal and also on, on the wood. Outstanding. So we'll get it back out in the field so that others can enjoy it. That's right. It okay. can look at another 120 years. I've seen a couple of things on it while I was looking at it that you had pointed out earlier. We've got a crack running right down what appears to be a replacement four end, so that'll have to be repaired. A crack right here through the uh, through the stock from the stock bolt back but the beauty of this is no one's tried to repair this <laughs> so we can do it the right way um so when people ask you know what should i redo my my mill syrup yes absolutely all day because what we're not going to do is cut this thing off at the muzzle and sporterize it we're just going to do 80 years of deferred maintenance. And what makes this gun so worth it is when you look down a barrel, the bore on this thing is cherry. So this gun should be very accurate when we get done with it. We'll get it cleaned up and let's give her a spin, huh? We'll get a take apart here. Let's get some tools out, eh, Bob? All right, let's do it. So now we're back here. We went ahead and broke out some tools. And we're going to watch Bob disassemble this gun here. And he's just going to kind of show you the... Uh, Show you sort of the procedure for taking one of these things apart. Let her rip, brother. Okay, Mark, thanks. Um, well, like all good gunsmiths, we should always check first see our weapon's not loaded. And not being loaded, we're going to proceed to remove the bolt from the gun. Rule number one, by the way, is get the, get the gun out of the hands of the customer. Rule number two, <laughs> you get keep your, yeah, this rule number true. two is keep your finger off the trigger. And rule number three is don't point it at something you don't want to kill. kill. Yeah. All right, this is a, a, Mad, a Mauser pattern rifle. And... Uh, uh, on all, all Mausers, the, there's a, a center takedown position on the bolt. So you want to turn that safety up to the 12 o'clock position. Then you can proceed to remove the bolt, withdraw it backwards, uh, take your thumb and push out on the uh, bolt stop. Hey, hang on a minute. Let, let, let that go for a moment, Bob. Yeah, okay, so here's the bolt stop back over here, the mystery hand. Go ahead and open that up now so they can see through your thumb. Outstanding. Thank you. Very good. No, that's something I had to learn. I hate that. You can't see through your hands. We're going to open the bolt stock, and then we're going to withdraw the bolt. Ooh, cosmoline, dirt, grease, nastiness. Yeah, ah. as you can see, this still wears uh, most of its uh, original arsenal uh, pickling oh. okay. lubricant, uh, the equivalent of our cosmoline. But uh, this is a, a little simpler than the Model 98 bolt. Um, this is a Model 93 pattern gun, although it is a, uh, a 1916 refurb. Uh, to the 1916 pattern. Uh, it's very simple, and once you got it at 12 o'clock, you can unscrew the well, fire, the fire control, 
and now you're separated into your fire control unit and, and your and your bolt bolt body with the attached uh, 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 extractor. These can then be set aside and then cleaned later. I want to make a point about that bolt when we clean it later about why we're not going to take the extractor off. There's an unobtainium part on the bolt body that I want to tell you about later. Proceed, sir. Very good. All right, now, uh, where do you proceed from here? On this particular rifle, the first thing you need to remove is this part right here. Oops. This Let's slide back a little bit. The, right there. This there is the front sight guard. And this has a pin, and usually these pins uh, drive in one direction, and this particular one, I think, drives out from left to right. Okay, so I've, I've given Bob something here. This is just a little plate of steel we have hidden underneath this. You all have seen my concrete, my... Uh, my my big heavy block but this will give him something to buck into because this when you hit this towel it's kind of soft have at all right thanks mark all right so we're going to take an appropriate size pin punch place it on the head of the pin and give it one good wrap to get it started there it goes and this hold this here nail while i whack it all right and there's your pin right there and then this particular sight can then be tapped off to the front. I'm just going to use I'm reaching under right now. a wooden, wooden screwdriver or hammer here. And there she goes. Popped right off. And there's your front sight protector. Which is bent? Or is it the front sight that's bent? I think the front thinking, sight protector looks like it got caved in a little bit. Uh, we'll take care of that. These happen, but these can be straightened out easily. It's pretty soft steel. So that's something we're going to tweak the blue one on, right? So we'll set that in a separate pile. We'll set that off here to the right. Here. Okay. Alrighty. Now, the next thing is we're going to remove these two bands. These bands uh, hold the fore end of the stock onto the barrel. And for that, you're going to need a screwdriver for this upper band. Let me turn this where you can see it a little bit better. We're going to insert the blade of the screwdriver just behind the band and push in on the leaf spring that's holding this band on and we're going to do that and a little bit of a wiggle and you should be able to pop it right out pop that right off there it goes the start it goes there it goes wow we did that without boogering up the wood or the metal amazing uh, oh that's even a better tool It's almost like I anticipated your needs. Now, see, now you can get that off because if this was here, you couldn't get that band off. So we'll set that aside. As well. And that's good too because it captures all those metal parts. If you disassemble this weapon in the field, you don't have all these little parts that you like need to operate the gun laying all over in the mud. Exactly, because it will get lost. It will. Uh, the middle Spotty band, proof. the middle band is, is fortunately on this particular rifle, it's got a protrusion here that you can get your thumb on and it will allow you to get that that particular band off. Okay. And on this model, it was a cavalry model, so it's got a slide, a side sling mount. Okay, that's it, that little swivel gizmo right there. Right, it comes off on the side, and there's a corresponding bar. In the back. In the stock. Ah. Uh, that attaches to. Okay, now. Now we want to get the handguard off the rifle. So we lift the front side up to 12 o'clock. We start wiggling and jiggling be careful not to this particular one's already cracked but this this is part of our our repair process you turn it 90 degrees and lift it off the gun yeah, let me show something here whoa we're gonna have to do something about that so that's gonna go down the other end of the bench now it's like a job wood. for acro glass yes that's an acro glass job <laughs> okay all right now we're going to turn our attention to this area right here. This, this is the bottom metal. This contains the floor plate and the, uh, uh, the trigger guard. We need to get that removed. And to do that, you're gonna have to break these two screws. And unfortunately, they're, they're loose. They've been jiggled loose. Hmm, nice amount of mung there. Yeah. So we are gonna go ahead and blue the head of that, you think? So that has to go in the blueing pile then. That'll go in the blue pile. Internal parts don't go in the blue part. External parts do. So we'll probably even do the, we'll take the barrel bands out and there's a stock crack we gotta fix. So this is a multi level repair. Exactly. Uh, this isn't just a single ended. No, most of these old reef, uh, uh, mill serps, uh, you're gonna find, 
it's kind of like buying an old house. Once you start trying to clean the place up, you're going to find a million things that are wrong. Right. And, and these guns are no different. There's all kinds of little problems that you're going to run into. And uh, Not the least of which is that it's kind of glued together. It's kind of glued together with uh, dried finish and Cosmo and everything else. This Mong. Mong. Yeah, you need a smaller pin. I, right need, here, a, I need a smaller pin. That should drive right out. And there we does. go. Blue pile. Okay. All right. Now we know now that we've got we've got the barreled action free of the wood, and what I like to do is, is take it off the bench and hold it up, and put your hand around the, the the stock and the barrel, and take the heel of your palm and, just and give it. the barrel a little pop like that, and that'll loose loosen the action. Right, it does. And it popped right out. Look at that. Oh, Sweet. Darn. Now let's inspect what we've got, and I'm I'm beginning to get a little happy here because. We've got a really fine condition gun to be as old as it is. And a lot of these old South American guns and, and Spanish guns, you'll find a, a tremendous amount of rust under the wood line. There's, right. a, there's a little bit right here, but that's going to clean up fine. I don't oh, see. We took a long Lee apart that was a disaster in here. It had great big shankers on it. And... Oh yeah, this is this is sweet here. Yeah, so, this is awesome. And she's still, as I can, I can see, she's still wearing most of her original blue. And, but we're going we're gonna to address that situation in a little bit. We're going to get this, this old girl cleaned up. And uh, uh, as opposed to doing a total strip down to bare metal blue, we're going to do a, <clears throat> what I call just a refurb blue. One of the nice things about rust blowing, Mark, is that you can, you can go back over areas. You can touch up areas. So if you've got shiny areas, right. you don't need to re-blue the entire firearm. Right. You can just use your rust blue solutions and you can re-blue some of these areas they've turned bright. And it's the difference between a bluing that's in the steel versus a bluing that's on the steel. Modern blues are on the top. Oh, the old timey blues are down inside and you can damn near not take it off with a yeah. wire brush. Well, as you know, when you're in, in, in the process of applying these rust blues, you, you have to card the steel. That is, you have to brush it or scrub it right. with steel wool or, or wire wheel. And that's part of the application process. And that stuff's a wire wheel or, or in a uh, wire wheel uh, or steel wool is not going to take this off. Uh, this, uh, yeah. Unlike, uh, you know, some folks are used to some of the cold blues. Uh, that you buy in the bottle and just swab on and wipe off. Those aren't really blues at all. Those, uh, what they do, they plate the steel with copper, and then there's a, a chemical in there that turns the copper black, and, and that's essentially what the bluing does, the, the bluing process for those. And th those are very thin and they don't wear well. Plus they stink. We kind of fast forwarded through the disassembly, uh, but needless to say, as you can look on the on the bench here, we've got all little pieces parts of this gun laid out. And what I'm preparing to do now is to uh, condition the metal prior to the bluing. We're going to introduce the, 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 the uh, corroded uh, areas of the steel to a steam environment. And we're going we're to steam it for about 10 or 15 minutes. And this will help convert some of the existing rust that's on the, good, on the gun to a black oxide. That will blend, it'll blend better with the gun. Uh, what I've got here in preparation, you're going to, you'll see the rig in just a minute. Uh, this is just a regular coat hanger that's been straightened out and uh, it's been inserted through the muzzle and exits the breech here and you just put a little L in it through the uh, rear uh, tang screw hole and that holds it. And this, what this will do is this will hold, this will hold the barreled action in the steam pipe. Uh, it'll, let you, it'll let you hang it. The conversion, if you guys want to go look it up, is we're going to convert ferric oxide to ferroferric oxide. Woohoo! And also, Bruno's sitting over here steaming at me because I'm the one that screwed up and moved the camera. So let me lock that back where it was. All right, Bob, let it rip. Okay. And I'm just going to do a little, little, little pre-steam cleanup here. And we're going to get off the, uh, some of the big pieces of the rust here. That, and this is a usual spot here on these, these particular rifles, this, this little front sight guard. It becomes an entrapment area for moisture, and then of course notice it, when he's using a, uh, a steel brush, we're we're rubbing, we're not abrading. It's a completely different process. If you get in here with sandpaper or you really really grind on it with a wire wheel really hard, you start to abrade, and that starts removing metal. That's bad. Sorry, Bob. Just wanted no, to throw fine. that Thanks. in there. I appreciate that, Mark. Yeah, yeah. Some of these areas are a little stubborn, and you just have to. Just have to persevere in here, but what we're trying to do is just get down to the thinnest coating of rust that we can have, 
uh, thick rust won't convert very well, but if you can get down to that little layer of rust that's just on the surface of the metal, you can, you can, uh, you can cause that to turn dark. And so I'm getting there now. What you guys are going to see is, is that the converted rust, the top layer of it's almost flaky and it's very easy to remove. Um, so then we're working with a very soft top layer that's easy to remove instead of really hard, really stubborn, like trying to grind down through the rust, you got to remove the metal to get down to the bottom of it. Yeah, well, progressing down the barrel now, I'm on the rear sight. Now th this particular gun, uh, this was, uh, this particular sight right here was the, the very first Mauser patent for a tangent rear sight. Uh, this, is the, this is the very first model and it was introduced on this rifle. If you really want to get into the nitty gritties in 93 pattern Mausers, go back and look at the primer on it. Yeah. It's very good. We know just enough about these things to stay out of our own way. <laughs> But they, they, uh, when these guns were made, they intentionally left this metal here with the graduations in meters in the white. The rest of the site was blued, but this part was left in the white to make it more easily visible because if, if it were blued, you'd have a really hard time seeing the numbers. Especially in low light. Yeah, I mean, you're out there in, uh, you're out there in the Spanish desert fighting some kind of conflagration and you look, you look, you look, you look to range your gun, you can't find your sight markings. So they put them in the white so you can see them. Sights? We don't need no stinking sights. No sights, man. Shooting by braille. <laughs> so we're just about there. In now the walking on that rear gonna, bridge. You're going to hear the odd bang because while Bob's doing that, I'm attempting to dynamite the butt plate screws out of the ass end of this thing. <laughs> Success. I am the carbon-based light form. So once we get this done, we're going to steam it and, and convert as much as we can of this stuff. And then we're going to coat the whole gun in a rust blowing solution. Now you say, what? Well, remember, we're not coating, we're not applying this stuff like paint. We're laying a chemical on the top and it will react with the metal that's bare and not react with the metal that's already been passivated. So what will happen is, is the bare spots will eventually catch up to the rest of the gun and the whole thing will look the same and it'll look correct and uniform. Exactly. And we're still preserving the original finish that was on the gun. So this is one way of doing this. Now, if this thing was all the way gone and rusted and pitted out, we'd have to go down to bare metal. But guys, we're doing what the armorers would do. They'd come in and scrub this thing, steam the crap out of it, and throw it back out in the field. So here we sit. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, now I've gotten just about all of it off that I can get off. <laughs> Victory! <laughs> all right. <laughs> Butt plate. Nice. I love it when that happens. Yeah. All right. All right. This, uh, this particular rifle was purchased by one of the students that I taught when I taught high school. So um, he gets the little, he gets the shout out. I'm not going to use his name because I'm not that stupid on the internet. Somebody will dox him. But we're, uh, we're redoing, um, I like this when people bring me stuff, especially when I've known them and taught them. And you know what? Everybody turns out okay eventually. So this knocking you hear is me just knocking the knocking the gun apart. So Bob and I are working and because we're working in parallel we might actually get this thing done in one sitting. Nice. And I just found the first pitting that I have okay. found on this rifle. With a tiny spot here. Yeah, nothing that's even going to come close. That gun that gun is built like a brick shit house. You're not going to DQ that for a pit unless it goes halfway through the bore. Yeah, I'm I'm totally completely unconcerned. Yeah, right, right there. there. Yeah, right I'm there. totally completely that's nothing. Yeah. And that's that's, that's going to be under the handguard. But and the most important part about this anyway. is we stopped it. Exactly. We stopped it from going any further. It's called maintenance, guys. Look it up. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, let's move over to the uh, the steaming apparatus, and I'll give you a brief uh, run over. Okay. Now we've moved over to a different part of the shop, and I'm going to uh, uh, describe to you the little contraption I've got put together to to uh, to rust blue guns at home without expenditure of a lot of money. One of the, one of the things that frustrates uh, amateur gunsmiths and 
folks trying to do restorations on a lot of these old guns that if you want to do a proper rust blue, they think that you got to go buy, you know, a hundred fifty dollar tank and a two hundred fifty dollar gas burner, and uh, before you know it, you got five hundred dollars invested in a system. Then you got to use distilled water, gallons and gallons and gallons of distilled water to boil stuff in. Well, that's not what industry did back in the day. Beginning in about the 1850s and on through World War I, most military farms and commercial farms at the time were rust blued. Uh, it started out as, as slow, cold rust blowing, and, and you've probably read about this, where it took days and weeks to rust blow a gun. Well, that's not good enough for industry. Industry had to have a way that when, when there's a war coming and I got to produce a thousand rifles a day, I got to have some way to do it. And that's what came, came to be known as accelerated rust blowing. And not only that, that's a very consistent process. What we're, accelerated rust blowing is consistent. Unaccelerated natural aid, it depends upon the natural humidity in the air. It depends upon a lot of stuff that you can't accurately repeat. And when you're in business, that just don't fly. So, so industry with, with access to steam in the plants, use steam to convert the, the, the oxide on the metal instead of boiling it in tanks. So what I've done here is put together a, a very inexpensive outfit. I got a little tur a turkey fryer, gas burner, a $10 stainless steel pot from the dollar store, uh, about $10 worth of cellular core PVC pipe. And make sure you get cellular core because uh, the regular PVC is too thin. You got to get the thicker one. Uh, then I just used a, uh, a notch the top of the pipe and then I, I took a three inch pipe cap and then this is the end off a broken rake is my crossbar. You put a quart of tap water in the pot, bring it to a boil and when the pipe gets good and hot like it is now, you introduce your metal in it to be steam. So what we're going to do is first of all before we start actually bluing, we're going we're gonna to convert as much of the rust that's on the gun to black oxide. So here's our, here's our 1916 Spanish. I put the, uh, the coat hanger through the barrel and affixed it through the, the guard screw hole and we're going to put it on our, put it on our uh, crossbar, our professional crossbar. Hang it, try to get it kind of centered in the pipe. There's two reasons for gloves guys. One, is you don't want to get oil on this action now. We've pretty much scrubbed it down and when we get it hot this time the oil will come off. And two, there's a lot of latent heat of vaporization in that steam and you better respect the fact that the steam burn is nasty because when it gets on you it just keeps on. Gloves are a must. Leather gloves are a must. All right, we're gonna uh, let that cook for about 10 minutes and come back to you. All right, fast forward 10 minutes. Uh, we've, had our, we've had our steel soaking now in, in live steam for for 10 minutes, we're going to cut our we're going to cut our gas off, and we're going to remove our steam pipe from the toilet flange on top. Take our cap off and pull out our barreled action. Well done. We don't have to tell you folks that this pig's hot, right? It's smoking hot. You better have gloves. It's, it's already starting to burn me through leather gloves. All right, over to the bench. So we're, now we're going to take her to the bench and we're going to do what's called, in the old days they called it scratching, uh, but nowadays we call it carding. In other words, we're going to, we're going to scrape off the loose rust with a, a wire brush. Our steel has cooled off to room temperature now. We can handle it. And we proceeded to uh, uh, the bench vise here where we've got just got a drill motor attached with a, with a, uh, a fine carding wheel. This is used to, to card uh, 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 rust blued guns and one important factor with this is you, you don't need to use this wheel on anything else. You, you need to get a wheel like this or you can use steel wool. If you don't want to buy a wheel you can use steel wool. But we're no. in a shop and we've got access to the wheel. You do not want to contaminate this wheel with grease or other metals. You want it only to be used to, to rub rust off of gun. And Bob, it's important to note that one of the places where all that contaminant comes from is oil is placed on steel wool when it's inside its package. So if you use steel wool, and by all means use it, um, I would say like a 4 odd or maybe a 3 odd. put it in a small container, pour some acetone in it, and get all the oil off the wool first. And then that way you don't contaminate it with the very thing you're using the current. Exactly. That's an excellent point. Uh, all right, let's get this drill motor running.
what you want to do is just you don't want to sit in one place too long you just want to move it back and forth until you can see the the the, the, the uh, blued metal revealed underneath it and look at hope the, the camera can pick this up right you can I think the camera can pick up the rust film that's on the surface of the metal. This is what happened when we steamed it in the steam pipe. We converted that rust layer to, uh, to magnetite and now we're going to cart off this, the, uh, the, the, the uh, oxide that's loose on the surface.
Okay. And I hope this comes through well in the video. But as you can see, all that rust was converted on this barrel. It was loosened and then it was able to be uh, wheeled away. There are some spots that where the bluing was removed up around the band up here, here on the barrel where the other band was. But uh, what we're going to do now is, is now that this is cleaned up, we're going to degrease it. And then from now on, you should only handle your gun metal with, with uh, I have nitrile gloves on, but latex works well, vinyl gloves work, but you don't want human hands to touch the metal after this. So in essence, Bob, what we're doing here is we're picking up right where the ordnance uh, guys left off. We've converted a layer and now we're going to add chemicals and just pick up where they left off and then everything will catch up. Outstanding. That's right. So don't worry, you guys that are doing this, uh, uh, don't worry about these little bright spots because all this will blend together. Once we get into the rust blowing process, the rust blowing chemicals by their nature will help blend and merge this all together. Then we can use the wire wheel then to groom that finish into a very uniform and a finish that will, that will be identical to what was on this gun when it left the factory. Okay, now we're ready to, uh, we've got this barrel carded. Uh, I, off camera, I degreased it with acetone, three washes. Uh, now what we're gonna do is put our first coat of rust blowing solution on here. Now this, this is a product I make. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination of, of, of uh, inorganic acids, metallic salts, surfactants and other agents, but it, it, it closely approximates what uh, an armory would have used in the late 1800s, early 1900s, which most of these farms that we're restoring were blued with. I'm going to, I'm going to wipe this on the steel, first coat, and this, this is going to dry for about an hour or so. Then we'll wipe on a second coat. And then after that second coat, we're going to introduce the uh, treated barreled action into a humidity box. And uh, at that time, we'll, we'll start to accelerate and induce rusting. And after that, we'll convert it back into pipe, and we should have a nice blue-black on this steel. Now, a point about applying this chemical. Most people apply way too much. Uh, this is not like applying uh, a cold blue, where you just slop it on and, and then wipe it off and then rinse it. Uh, you need to put just the barest amount mm -hmm. of this on, on the steel. And the best way I can tell you to approximate that is, Think of yourself as taking a, a, a magic marker and wiping it over a piece of paper. That's the kind of layer you want. You, no drips, no runs, no sags. You just want a sheen uh, uh, film wiped on the steel. And when you're doing a, a long piece like a barrel, you need to, you need to start and, and get the whole length at one time if you can. You don't want to, uh, with barest of oak, just barely overlap. So an important thing to note here is, is that when you're applying this chemical, this is not a coat like Bob said. You're just putting the chemical on and it only takes a little bit and you're just provoking the steel to start reacting with the oxygen in the atmosphere. That's all you're doing here. That's exactly right. So you, you want to wet, wet your cotton ball and then, and then uh, if you have to, squeeze out the excess, which I've done. And you can see we just got a barely dampened cotton ball. And you'll need to recharge this every so often as you, as you run. So the first thing I do usually I'll run around the muzzle real quick. Hey Bob, while you're working, how many guns can you typically do out of a bottle of that rust blue? Keep going. I mean this this yeah. little two ounce bottle, believe it or not, will do about twenty long guns. Nice, nice. I'm gonna put that. To That's the how test. little you have to use. And so I'm right. So this does not have to be dunked in a tank, although I'm sure the armory guys just had a tank with about 3,000 gallons of that crap in it and they went for it. That's exactly right. But we're not armory guys and we're not funded by the United States government. Therefore, we have to use, shall we say, less fiscally invasive methods. Nice. Nice even strokes as he's applying from top to bottom. Just swab it on. Now, as you can see, we're not covering anything, so prep is 98%. If you can see it without the chemicals on it, you will be able to see it with the chemicals on it. You're not going to hide anything. However, this gun is 100 years old, so we're not trying to make any apologies for it. It is what it is. And, um, you know, we're just trying to make it look good. Put it on under the stock line as well as on top of the stock line because good craftsmanship dictates that if you knock it out of the stock, it should look like you gave it down below the stock line too. <laughs> 
this first setup, we're going to allow it to attack the steel for a little while. There's enough moisture in this room that it'll start to attack the uh, attack the steel. Then we're I'm going to admit to the fact that Bruno and Bob and I are going to go run out and grab something to eat right quick. Meanwhile, while this is going on, the Acroglass is setting over there on the stock. I've got the lamp on top of it. I've already made you watch the epoxy set once. I'm not going to make you do it twice. We're going to go visit a guest forge and have them forge us some hamburgers. And then when we come back, we'll pick this up again, which for you will be right about, I don't know, now. Okay, we're back in the shop. We've, uh, we've coated our barrel with a priming coat of rust blowing solution. We let that sit for about an hour and dry. Then I recoated it with, with the first primary coat uh, of rust blue solution. Now I'm going to take your attention to uh, this highly sophisticated device here. This is my grand moving wardrobe drying chamber uh, uh, humidity box. Um, Ooh, high speed. Every, most everybody's got one of these in the attic somewhere. You can run down to your U-Haul dealer and get one. But oh, uh, I use it because it's convenient and it works. And it's, it was cheap. The price was right. Uh, I've got our barrel that we've, we've treated with our second coat of rust blue right here. And we're hanging it on the crossbar. And first of all, we're going to close, close shop up here. And we're going to heat this. And the reason we're going to heat it with dry heat is that what we want to do is raise the, the temperature of the metal to the point where it's well above the dew point. Because right afterwards, I'm going to introduce a source of steam by way of a, of a, of a child's vaporizer. You can, I picked this one up at a uh, local pharmacy for 17 bucks new. You could probably find one yard sale for a dollar. Low drag. Also going to be using a common ceramic heater. This provides my heat source. Price was right on that too. Now, one modification you need to make to the box is, is, a, is, a, is a doorway in the bottom. And all you need is just take a, a razor knife and cut yourself a door out and then cut a little half moon shape here to get your finger in. And that opens up just like that. This allows you to introduce your heat source and your steam source into your box. So now I'm going to go ahead and cut my heat on. And I'm just going to put it there just like that. And these boxes, there's enough gaps in them, they'll, they'll naturally vent. So we're going to let that work for about uh, five or ten minutes and then we'll come back to you. We've been in the hot box now for about ten minutes. So what I'm going to do now is, is remove our heat, dry heat source, and cut that off. And down here I've, I've, got our, I've got our little moisture pot. Moisture provider, which is our little vaporizer. And we're going to control the conditions under which this metal is rusting. So by getting it hot, we've heated up the metal so that none of the water condenses on it. It makes these pretty little polka dots all over everything. Yeah, you toasted yourself with the cord, Bob. I did. Let me straighten that out for the camera. Yeah, let's do that. Because it's important. The electricity doesn't like to flow through knots. No, it doesn't. Everything. The number one cause of death amongst electricians is falling off of ladders. Remember that, boys and girls. There we go. All right. So now, now we're going to wait in the steam. Uh, it's going to continue to check. This steam's going to fill this chamber up. And, and, and we're going to now just let this, we're going to let it uh, ripen, as they say. Uh, it'll under, be obvious. It'll look like fuzz almost. It'll look like, it'll look like brown frog hair fuzz. Yep. And uh, so it's going to take about 30 to 45 minutes and we'll rejoin you. No, brown haired frogs were harmed in the process of making this video. Yes. All right. Well, it's, it's been a little over 45 minutes. We're, we're actually coming up on about an hour and 10 minutes uh, due to conditions, but we, we do have some rust forming and I want to go ahead. Now I'm going to take this barrel out, barrel action. And we're going to put it back in the steam pipe and get it converted. Look at that sucker, man. That thing's jet black. Dude. Most, most of the white spots have already turned jet black. Uh, if you hold the barrel at a, at a sharp angle to the light, and I know it's There's difficult no and next to impossible to do that here on, on the show today, but uh, you can see a fine frog hair rust all over the barrel. And I know on camera it looks black, but, it, but there is a fine brown frog hair rust. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And I've got to tell you something else. In that 45 minutes, we haven't been just sitting here. Um, I've been, I've got my hands oily. Bob's got his hands clean. So Bob has been doing the small parts, getting them ready to rust. 
and I have been doing the uh, small parts like the screw heads and everything with the burner and blue in it like we did when we did the screw. So um, we've used that time. Time is a tool. Professionals and amateurs, the difference between a professional and amateur is an amateur will expend time to save materials, whereas professionals expend materials to save time. In this particular case, Bob and I are, are ganging on this gun because we want to get it done sometime this decade. So having said that, I've got the oily hands, Bob's got the dry hands, so the difference between white collar and blue collar is whether you wash your hands before or after you take a piss and I'm out of here. <laughs> okay, so we're going to take our, we're going to take our barrel to action out and we're going to take it to the steam pipe and we're going to uh, steam it under high volume of steam uh, for about 10, maybe 12 minutes and uh, when we rejoin you, we'll, uh, the barrel will be cooled down, out of the steam, cooled down and we'll be uh, carting it and let you see the color. Okay, our, uh, our barrel has finished steaming, and as you can see, it's got a pretty, pretty mottled appearance. It's, there's, there's all kinds of colors going on in there. There's blues and blacks and purples and, and all sorts of colors. But that's just oxidation up on the surface. And what we're going to do right now is what's called carding. In the old days, it was called scratching. But uh, carding is merely rubbing off the loose oxide off the metal with either uh, uh, a wire brush, uh, as we did earlier, a wire, a wire wheel, or as I'm going to demonstrate here, just plain old degreased uh, uh, steel wool. And I think this is like uh, 3 aught steel wool, uh, just like you get at your local hardware store. Uh, just make sure that you uh, get some acetone. Let's get some acetone and do three washes of acetone and dry that steel wool out because steel wool comes packed with oil on it from the factory. So what we're going to do, we're going to start up here on the barrel and just merely, uh, again, use nitrile gloves or, or uh, any kind of glove to keep your skin oil off the barrel. And we're just going to lightly start rubbing. And I want you to look at that color coming out there. Look at that. Look at that black. Right up under that loose oxidation, you got that black. Ooh, that's some sexy shit right there now. Check that out. Okay, and even though there was some a good bit of bluing still on this barrel, uh, it, it would have been very hard to have spot blued it and let it all blend in. So it's, I went ahead and coated the whole thing so that everything's going to have the same texture after that chemical works on it. And that's the difference between rust bluing and just regular rust. Regular rust forms a very large grain. It's very flaky. What we're doing with our chemicals is controlling the size of the grains. We're also controlling the environment under which it rusts. And since we're only rusting it for a very short period of time, it has an opportunity to oxidize, but not pit. It doesn't dig down into the steel. And that's what produces this nice, lustrous finish. It's the same thing if you'd have grabbed like a, a wrench you left out in the garage that got rusty and you scrubbed it all down and all of a sudden it's a dark color. That's exactly what happens. All right, and there you go. And, <clears throat> and later on we're going to treat this barrel and we're going to immerse it in some kerosene. Right. And that's going to be our final uh, uh, treatment process. And that will, that will make this at least two shades darker. At least. It hits the oil. Hey, and a word on after oils, guys. The first coat of oil you put on this gun cannot be gun oil. Gun oil has rust inhibitors in it, and we've just spent the last four hours of our lives trying to rust this thing. So we got to make sure that we, inhib we dunk it in an oil that has absolutely nothing in it. Kerosene is that. Kerosene also chases any residual water molecules that might be mudcatting underneath here and knocking all that out. So just be very, very careful. You cannot put gun oil on a freshly blue gun. It's got to be like um, a non-detergent. Old motor oil actually works really well, too, for your for old motor oil. Stuff that's actually been in an engine for three or 4,000 miles and has had all the detergents burned out of it. Um, I've got about a five-gallon tub of that crap laying around here we use just for that. Okay, so I got a pipe sitting over here in the corner that's full of uh, it's kerosene. What we're going to do here is just dunk this thing down inside the kerosene and let it sit there and let it cook for about. You don't have to do this step. I prefer to do this step. It's just, um, I think it toughens up the bluing better. Ordinarily, you just let the bluing set overnight and you'd be just fine. While Bob's been working on the bluing, I've been taking care of, uh, I don't know if you can see down in here. Hang on a minute. Let me get, there you go. 
I've kind of fixed this entire crack. There was a beautiful crack that started right here at the stock bolt. And as you can see, worked its way all the way back up here to the end of this, uh, <clears throat> of the uh, bolt release cut. That was flexing. So what I did was, is I made a, a tangent cut, dropped a bolt down in it, acroglassed all that over. I also did the same thing on the fore end. The fore end was cracked all the way through here. We saw that during teardown. And I, I just glassed that back together again and then stained it so that it, it, looks, it looks correct when you're looking at it. We're just doing armory level repairs. Okay, the other thing I did when you flip this stock over and take a look at it here, let me get up in here. You see all this nastiness right here, all this blackness. There's a lot of uh, oxidation staining. Now, a little bit of 4 aught steel wool and some kerosene produces a stock that looks like this. We didn't remove the finish. All we did was we took the oxidation off the outside of it. We've cleaned this up. This still has finish on the outside of it. It still has a couple little nicks and pops, but this is where I'm going to leave it because this is all it would have done in armory level maintenance. So we're just trying to uh, bring the gun back, and I think we're doing okay on it. So this is kind of what I've been doing while Bob's been bluing. You've got two guys hacking away on this pig. I'm going to tell you what. The other thing we've been doing is we've been uh, going through and doing the screws, if I might have one. Just pick the biggest one you can find. There you go. We've been going back through, and I've been cleaning up the screws. I've been making the screws. Let's see here. I've got to be in focus against something white. There we go. Um, I've been doing the screws, and I went through and cleaned them up, blued them, got all the mung off of them. Before I blued it, I went ahead and took a hammer, polished hammer faces, remember? Went ahead and took a hammer and pushed all that metal back down in. Tap, 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 right? And got the screws cleaned up. I'm doing the barrel bands. I did the bolt release. I did a whole bunch of things to it. Um, stuff that you wouldn't want to rust blue because it would just take too damn much time. Oh, my God. But the most important thing is, is that this is how this would have been done originally anyway. Now, they would all have been set on a tray with a little bit of oil on them. They'd have stuck them in a furnace. They'd have run them up to about 490, maybe 500 degrees. They would have all relatively heat treated, and it would have put a coat of finish on it that would hold up uh, until the first time you started scrubbing on it, and then the whole thing would turn white. And then your, uh, the, the oils in your hands and the salts would turn the whole thing brown, and it would look like what it looked like when we walked in here. All right, just a little bit of cleanup here, the acro glass on the inside. Um, and then what I'm going to do here is make sure that the, that the action fits down. And then the forend was split. The forend was split, and all of this mess right here got chewed up because the forend ring could not seat. So we got the crap beat out of it. So what I've done now is, is not only am I going to fix the fact that the forend was cut, we're going to fix why the forend was cut. Whoa, root cause analysis. Who knew? So that's all I'm doing here is I'm tightening this up, and then let me get this vise pulled down here so that it won't move around on me. Uh, we're going to set this in. Uh-oh, did I do what I think I did? I sure did. That came all the way off. Nga! Okay. Saliva causes cancer, but only swallowed in small amounts over long periods of time. Okay, um, let's see here. So we'll do this. And then, uh, do me a favor and hand me the forend over there, please. The the uh, the guard, the forend, right there, the wood by the by the red handle. Outstanding, thank you, sir. So this is going to have to eventually sit right here. One of the beauties of this gun was was that it was never modified, and it's still in seven by fifty-seven miles. This is going to be a shooting fool when we get done with this. So this will have to sit down right there and what I'm here to figure out is why it didn't sit <sighs> that should be pretty close to going down in there note that as we've blued this and we haven't waxed it yet but as we blued it one of the biggest tenets of this is to not screw it up in the first place we did not come after this with 60 grit sandpaper we didn't come after this with a full-on wire wheel we didn't come after it with a lot of things we didn't even take the original bluing off of it we just rusted right over the top of it so we got enough work to do without having to create a bunch of work for ourselves. So right there is the problem. That's what broke it. So what I got to figure out is how to make this set back further. And it's touching right there. So I'll open up this inlet right here. I'll just come in and I don't even know how the hell I'm going to do that. Uh, I got to figure that out. We'll come in with some chisels here and cut this out until this piece 
which is, might have been a replacement piece, will go back far enough that this ring, are we in shot there, that this lines up to right here. And once that goes in, notice I've done all this without putting all the other claptrap in place. One of the tenets of inletting is, is that you start one part at a time until you get all the way done. So I'll just, uh, I'll go in and clip this off and uh, we'll be back here once we get it put back together again. The rest of, the, the rest of this is literally, we're going to show you all the parts in there as clean and as uh, conditioned state. Then we'll reassemble the weapon and uh, we'll, we'll catch you guys when it's all put back together again. All right, here it is. We've got all the parts done. Uh, we've been through this entire weapon now. We've got it all the way apart down into its lowest common denominator. We've torn the bolt down and completely recleaned it. We have polished the front of the firing pin because it had a little bit of a nick in it. Um, we, and we've cleaned up and re-blued everything. We fire blued most of it. We uh, rust blued the other parts. Guys, I'm going to tell you something here. Why are we here? This was an entire shop day with two gunsmiths. We did $600 worth of work on this gun. I'm going to tell you that. And the thing is, the average guy can't afford that. And the average guy in the last three generations couldn't afford it either. So here's kind of the problem we're having. Let's face it, you own this gun because it was inexpensive. Okay? The really nice versions of these guns are all in private collections or they're in museums. And that leaves the rest of this stuff out here. It has not had the maintenance done on it because the uh, massive government armories that used to take care of these things don't take care of them anymore. And let's face it, when this weapon was built, no one in their right flipping mind thought 101 years later we'd have this thing torn down and laid out on this bench. So here's the conundrum we're getting in. The available Milserp rifles are beginning to disappear because they're just literally rotting out. You guys can do this maintenance. It can be done. You do not have to tear it all the way down. The real issue is this. Who in their right mind is going to pay my shop what we've spent to do this gun? And the only reason why we were able to do it is because we're being supported by individuals on Patreon. That's the only way we could afford to shut this shop down for a day and do this gun. They're expensive. I could probably have done it without all the filming equipment um, and without Bob's help in about five to six hours if I was humping it. But let's face it, no one's going to spend five to six bills on a $150 gun to have it brought back to life. It's a conundrum. It's one we face. If you're going to do work and you want to take one of these things and modify it, Go out on Gun Broker, go out on Gun List, and go find one that's been bubbed. This was a parts complete weapon with a clean bore, and all we have done is just gently done an armory restall for it. We can do this, we can save these things, but at the end of the day, they're gonna go away eventually, and there's really not a whole hell of a lot we can do about it except to get educated and do what three generations of men before us could not do, which was figure out how to climb down inside one of these things and do what the armories used to do. That's my rant. That's where I'm at. Just saying. Another successful trip down the rabbit hole. Boy, you got to love that. Man, we fixed cracks. We did all kinds of stuff. Got the handguard mounted. Good looking thing. Ross Blue, I'm telling you, man, this is the stuff right here. We use about 10 drops of this. A bottle of this is good for you and, I don't know, 14 or 15 of your best friends. So, Bob, thanks a lot for You're giving welcome. me help Glad here. And we'll it. catch you guys on the backside. Thanks a lot.